covers and showcases the best of Liberia and shows the world the truth about Liberia. We educate, elevate, and promote all things Liberia. We conduct interviews, panel discussions, debates, and more. Tune in to Focus on Liberia on Facebook and YouTube and be a part of the stories that make up the news. This is Focus on Liberia, and I am Dennis Jack. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to yet another edition of the Liberia History Channel on Focus on Liberia. My name is Dennis Jai, and we are broadcasting from Atlanta, Georgia. For some time now, we've been doing a series on the presidents of Liberia. We started with Joseph Jenkins Robert, and now we are at number 13, and that's uh, William David Coleman. So our series on the presidents of Liberia continues today with President William David Coleman. Of course, our chief presenter here is Carl Fambula. Carl, welcome to Focus on Liberia. It's always my pleasure to be here. By the way, this is our third edition of Focus on Liberia for 2023. And we're also joined by our friend, uh, I call him the young African-American scholar of the Basel background, you know, he chose Basel. I wanted to put him to crew, but he chose Basel. So, you guys are <laughs> back to the show. <laughs> welcome back. It's great to be back. We are so glad to have you. And I uh, want to welcome our viewers from across the globe. This is Focus on Liberia, the Liberia History Channel, where we talk the history of Liberia. Never has this been done in the history. Uh, or if I will quote my friend SpongeBob, he said, in the history of history. In the history of history. <laughs> so, <laughs> welcome. And uh, today we're going to be talking about President William D. Coleman. I always like to uh, think about my, you know, rhyme in uh, grade school, you know, stating from Joseph Jenkins Robert all the way to Samuel Canyon Doe. That was the time I was in school. So I stopped to, you know, yeah. And so that, that was the, uh, I always like to flag this, Joseph Jenkins Robert, we are at number 13, William D. Coleman. That's the president, William D. Coleman. And let me turn it over to our presenter, starting with Carl. Yes. So today we are presenting on William D. Coleman. Um, as, as Dennis said, and what we're going to do is kind of the format we followed with, with uh, Jabari last time. I'm going to do a little bit about his genealogy, his background, and then we're going to dive into his career. Thank you. Absolutely. J Jabari, uh, I, I don't want you to just reintroduce yourself, but just talk to our uh, viewers what you bring to this discussion. And Vera, I'm always excited to have you. Uh, you've been here a couple of times, but I always like to refresh people, you know, Jabari and what he does and what he brings to the discussion. Yes, so I'm going to be discussing William David Coleman's presidency, the events that shaped his presidency, and the events that will happen. Thank you. And we're going to go straight into our presentation. Yes. So um, this is a photograph. I'm very much about accuracy in presenting um, people as they actually were and not these uh, altered photographs of these giants. Um, William David Coleman, in fact, um, was an African. He was described uh, by his contemporaries in multiple sources uh, while he was still alive as a Negro. No one, while he was alive, referred to him as a mulatto. And I'm having to say this with every president so far, it seems. And it's because you will read multiple sources, including you know anything you look up on the internet, Wikipedia, whatever, they're gonna call him a mulatto. He was not mulatto. Uh, there's nothing in his genealogy that suggests that he was mulatto or that his parents were mulatto. Um, so that's important to note. Um, he's always been described as a Negro. Uh, William David Coleman, I want to also make a correction. When I did President uh, Russell, I stated that President Russell was the only president to have been born into slavery. That was not correct. 
President Russell was the first president to have been born into slavery. William David Coleman was also born in the same state of Kentucky, in the same county, also into slavery. So that, need, that needed to be corrected. So if you go back to the Russell uh, episode, that is a uh, something that needs to be corrected. Sometimes when you're doing these live and you're talking things, you know, um, you, you represent, you, you may say things that you have to go back and correct. And we are all about accuracy and making sure we present information um, as accurately as possible. So anytime I find information that is either contrary to or even enhances something that we discussed, I will bring it up in future episodes. So we're very much about making corrections if there's anything that is amiss. Uh, so that was important to note. Uh, he was, of course, the 13th president of the Republic of Liberia um, from 1896 to 1900. He was emancipated from slavery with his mother and father in the will of Presbyterian minister, Dr. Wardrop. Now, this is important. Um, when you read some sources, they claim that Coleman was uh, emancipated with his mother, who was a widow. His father actually died after they arrived in Liberia. So his father was emancipated with his mother and he was the only child that they did not, that, that the wardrobe plantation did not sell into slavery, into another plantation, I'm sorry, they were already enslaved. So what is one of the, the greatest tragedies with this situation with Coleman is that his parents had many children, but they were sold to other plantations. So when uh, Wardrow, Dr. Wardrow died when this Presbyterian minister, man of God who owns human beings, when he died in 1853, the only child that they still had in their possession that he still owned was, at the time his, he was called David, was David Coleman. The rest of his siblings were sold. I, I, I'm only thinking about that. That's why I'm quiet, right? <laughs> like, as you have the children, they they uh they sell them, and so yes. Rest. And this was this was something that happened when you have. This is why it's called chattel slavery. They were not looked at as human beings. They were not respected as families. They were looked at as property. And so, if you have, um, you know, if you have children and they're girls and they're you know very well mannered and they look like they could be sold at a high price as domestic servants they're sold um human beings were bought sold and trade like animals traded like animals um he emigrated from kentucky upon dr wardrow's death he, he emancipated um, all of his uh enslaved people and uh, they were all sent to liberia uh, because they wanted basically to remove them from the United States. Um, they didn't seem, seem to think that there was a future for freed African people. Uh, remember at this time, slavery is still not abolished. It's before the Civil War, but they're doing this massive dumping of people that they liberate upon their deaths into Liberia at this point. Prior to this time period in the 1850s, um, repatriation was mostly voluntary, but at this point we've got the Kentucky, Mississippi and a lot of these southern states are uh, basically sending mass numbers of, of um, emancipated people back to Liberia in, in, uh, prior to the Civil War. Uh, and then in 1854, he went to, I mean, uh, he emigrated from Kentucky to Liberia on the ship called Bashi in uh, 1854 with his father, whose name was Presley Coleman, and his mother, Ellen. They settled at Cape Clay Ashland. And this is just a brief summary. Jabari will get a little bit more into what happens when they go to Kile Ashland and how poor they were. And, you know, when his father died, they were really thrust into poverty because now you have this woman and this young son who, you know, that's all that that's there in the family unit. So, so David was two years old when he went to Liberia? No, we'll talk about that in a second. He was at the record, the primary source states that he was 15. Oh, OK. I was looking at this uh, immigrant list. And I see David too. Maybe that's another David. Yeah, let's focus on the on the presentation. Then it's just throwing me no, off. I'm, I'm, reading, I'm like, what? No, I'm, I'm reading okay. this, right? Yeah, but okay. let's go in order. Let's go in no, order. No, okay. I'm, I'm I'm reading what is on the screen. Yeah, I haven't gotten to it yet. So oh, okay. he's so so they get on the ship this year 
with Presley. So if you look at where the red arrow is pointing, that's his family. The red arrow is pointing at David. So number 213 is Presley Coleman. He was 38. That's his father. Okay. And Ellen is listed as 30 years old. So David is 15. Oh yeah, David is 15, right there. Now, are these ages estimations? Probably not. And the reason is they were slaves. So the records that were kept for these people were meticulous. Because the property records, they paid, they, they paid taxes on these people, right? And they held deeds for them. So as a, as, as you, as a, as an enslaved African American woman gives birth, that birth record is recorded as property. And that property becomes an asset to the, to the estate of the owner. So they were very meticulous about records. So in this case, if he was 15 years old at that time, the date of birth that is in his biography almost everywhere um, that says July 18, 1842 is less likely to be accurate. Because even, you know, all of the actual primary source records tracing David show him as being 15. The other possibility is that this isn't David, <laughs> right? And that, you know, he's, he's someone else. But there's no other record of anyone from Kentucky with the name Coleman going to Liberia that particular year. So, and also from Fayette County, Kentucky. So I want to believe that he was probably 15. And that his age was an estimation. And, you know, this thing with people going somewhere, not being able to read and write, having to start school, having a late start, having to start school, having a late start in life. Um, that may have been a reason to, you know, reduce the age. It happens now. Right. So that I'm not sure of, but that could have been a reason to do so. Or, you know the ship records and the ACS and the slave records are, are inaccurate, which is less likely. So we're gonna get quickly into this, what we always do. This is the most common image of President William David Coleman, which is why everyone thinks he's mulatto. Because there's this stamp drawing that was made by F.R. Bruns from the Smithsonian Institute who was, um, who basically was given the responsibility to go to Liberia and create this presidential stamp series and help to market Liberia to the world. And he's the one responsible for these images that we see. And I've repeated this almost every show. But this is an example of part of the president's, president's of Liberia series. The arrows pointing to where it's giving our, I mean, FR Bruns of the Smithsonian Institution credit for this mulatto looking <coughs> president. And he was the curator for the stamps exhibit at the Smithsonian. So he was an expert in this. And what he would have done, or what he did, not what he would have done, what he actually did in the 1950s is he went and looked at their actual photographs and had them sketched <coughs> to look more like what he was comfortable with, more like a white person. You have to remember this is the height of Jim Crow and racism and, and segregation in the United States in the 1950s, you know, God forbid that they show all these people during a time when the United States held slaves that looked like slaves. <laughs> so, you know, they needed to, they needed to, in his mind, you know, being a racist had to make our presidents look like something they were not. You wanna ask any questions or go to the next slide? Any thoughts? Okay. So now we've got, you know, three images that are very common of President Coleman, or one not as common, but the two most common ones are the, the ones that are really in black and white, the stamp drawing, which is a, another version of what I just showed. The one in the middle is actually based on the actual photograph. It's just a digitally remastered, 
you know, photograph. So it's been touched up a little bit and they kind of, you know, it looks to me like they straightened his hair a little bit and tried to make him again, look the way they wanted him to look. But this, this photograph in the middle has been altered. It is an actual photograph, but it has been digitally altered. Like we say, uh, they've used a filter, <laughs> but it's not actually a filter. It's something that was done professionally. Probably a restoration because it was maybe faded because it was so old. So someone, some artist would have come in and just fixed it so that you can see his features clearly. Um, and they got it almost right. The photograph on the far right is from, was, was taken and published by Heard while he was still alive, by William Heard while President Coleman was still alive. And this is the most accurate representation of President Coleman, the photo to the far right. And I know every time we're gonna revisit this uh, repeating theme of changing the photographs to uh, depict of what they want him or what they want them to look. Right. And I know you, you keep referring to it and it's very, and I promise you we're gonna do a separate show on this whole idea of photos, changing the images to look what they want it to be. So it's gonna be a separate show. If you yeah, if you have a still have questions on that, we're gonna do a separate show on that. So we put all in one. So we'll go ahead and I'll turn over to Jabari. I'm going to interject um, of, at a couple of points, but Jabari, the floor is yours to go over this. Yes, um, but before we get into that, before we get into his career, uh, I'm going to start with a primary source. Um, it's from a uh, book called The Bright Side of African Life, because that's also somewhere where you see William David Coleman's picture, and it gives a description of who he was. Um, so I would like to start with that first before I get into his career, and it's going to be reflective of it. It says, His yeah. Excellency William David Coleman, one of the Republic's most successful farmers and merchants, resides at this point, that being in Clay Ashland. His residence is the model for Liberia. Every improvement that can be obtained, he has in his house. He is a wealthy man. He has been in politics for many years and has been elected vice president for three successive terms. And when President J.J. Cheeseman died November 12, 1896, President Coleman succeeded him. He has not the education nor the originating faculty of the late president, but is a man of much common sense and is very economical in his habits. The very man for the Republic in this time of struggling to survive the bills of debt. And the last paragraph reads, his countenance is expressive of determination of honesty and of faithfulness, all of which a man to be at the head of this nation needs. He does not drive men from him. His very face invites to better acquaintance. President Coleman is a Whig in politics and has, a, and has received the nomination of his party, which is equivalent to election. We have faith in his future and Liberia's growth under him. So that is what the bright side of African life describes William David Coleman, and that's going to be very reflective of his careers. So, as I said, he was a and farmer. Just, re just really quick. So, the very first picture and the picture on the far right is also William Hurd, who published the book The Bright Side of Africa. So, that picture on the far right is from the book The Bright Side of Africa. So, that's also ah, from okay. William Hurd. Yeah. Go ahead, Dennis. So, in his career, he served as a canoe paddler on the St. Paul River. He was a carpenter, he was a farmer, merchant, and then in politics from 1877 to 1879, he was representative speaker of the House for Montserrat County. From 1879 to 1891, he was a senator for Montserrat County. And from 1892 to 1896, he was vice president of under President Cheeseman. And then from 1896 to 1900, he was the president with his vice president being Joseph J. Ross. Well, you know, peddler. I, I like that career. <laughs> <laughs> People are crossing the St. Paul River, and uh, you got this young man who's going to cross you, right? Yeah. And and this this is a, a a man whose father died while he was while he was still while he was still relatively young, an adolescent. So he had to take over pretty quickly for his mother. Um, and. 
before we get to the career, any information on his education? Because according to what Barry saying, it was he was not really educated, but had common sense. <clears throat> so, so he wasn't educated. He had to drop. I think he had to drop out of school. And so, but at the end of the day, he still maintained his education. At nighttime, he would go. He would learn on his own. So he doesn't have necessarily the formal education, but he took education into his own hands. He he actually did attend school in Liberia. He just didn't go very far. And so he was clearly he was literate. He could read and write. But if you compare him to Cheeseman or Warner or any of these other presidents who went, you know, through university and became highly educated, he was not even a high school graduate. So he was probably, you know, dropped out around eighth grade. So it's not that he didn't have any formal education. And at the end of the 19th century, that was, you know, even being a high school, you know, an eighth grade student at the end of the 19th century was a huge accomplishment uh, for anyone in the African world. So we don't want to make it look like among black, like if they had taken him to the United States or the Caribbean or anywhere else in the world, that this would have made him at, you know, some kind of made him deficient in some way. It's just that his predecessors were extremely right. accomplished right i mean compared to the other presidents he, he, he was exactly that's just what i just wanted to correct that because jabari sometimes the, the audience will hear it as meaning that you know everybody else in the society was more educated and he was you know yeah but he still learned on his own Let, let's not yeah. he still we want to emphasize that as well he Went on his own. Even though he stopped at eighth grade, he continued his education. He was self taught. That's what you're saying. Yep. Mm -hmm. So this so this is a photograph of President Coleman and his cabinet. And yes. this is also another photo you can get uh, from the herd from the Bright Side of African Life as well. So just to point out in this picture, you see Coleman seated with his leg crossed. So as you can see, he's clearly not a mulatto. <laughs> and then you have his vice president, J.J. Ross, also seated with his uh, next to the table. So that's the president and vice president seated. So he established influence of the Liberian government in the interior of the Northwest of his hometown of Clay Ashland. He reorganized customs department and installed uh, bonded warehouses at six ports. That was based off 1864 Port Entry Act, um, where foreigners were only allowed to trade and undermine economic activities. He was, he wanted to increase the government present in the in the interior and once again this is important uh we're going to get into it later but this the scramble for africa is in full effect and determining borders is starting to become set so he wants to have that presence in the interior since he was convinced that the future of liberia depended on um the exploration of the resources as well as the people there in the interior and he faced opposition from within his government and how he handled some events particularly what uh, Cal's going to go later into some of the inter-ethnic conflicts that are going to arise. And then after his resignations, uh, after he resigns, he's going to resign. Um, that's going to lead to W, uh, Garrison W. Gibson taking office. Are we going to get into the reason why he resigned? Yes. Absolutely. This is, okay. Yeah. This is just some one, background. One, I'm sorry. One, th one thing I want to point out, Jabari, we skipped over. Um, Dennis, if you can go back to the slide with the gentleman seated, because we're kind of doing things a little bit out of order. Um, just if you can go back to this. Okay. So Cheeseman, the reason he took over, the reason he took office is because Cheeseman died on November 15th, 1896. Um, in the middle of Cheeseman's third term, he died. And Coleman was his vice president. And that's why Coleman took over. And then um, basically completed the achievements term before being elected on his own right. So I just wanted to make sure we didn't skip over that. Sorry, Jabari, go ahead, please. Oh, no, you could. That's important. A uh, note to make note. He was vice president under achievement, so that is important to know. Mm -hmm. Continue on. 
So this is just some basic information. Um, he also had a policy where he worked with Dr. Edward Wilmot Blyden at Liberia College in Monrovia. And then this just goes back to his background of being House of Representatives and him running for the True Leagues. Next. So, so in 18, it is, in 1877, he was elected to the House of Representatives and became Speaker. Two years later, he was elected Senator for Montserrat County. He remained in the Labyrinth Senate until he was elected Vice President on Achievement on the True Way ticket. They were elected twice to the year to a two-year presidential term, and Kuma became president after Cheeseman died. He had a policy where he worked with Blyden. So Cheeseman real estate law in government. <laughs> I mean, I, and I see how he moved through, you know, from representative senator, two-time vice yeah, president, yeah. Yeah, president. Yeah. Impressive. Next. So President Achievement wanted to make sure that Liberia was uh, politically stable, was economically thriving and financially sound. At the end of the 19th century, um, they are going to be described, and this is important when we describe terminology. One of the terminologies that you start using, especially when we see George Red um, from George Stetson to Liberia in the 1900s, where you're gonna see the words America Liberian show. It's important for people to understand that because that is not what people in Liberia are going to describe themselves. That's what's going to be used by outsiders when they are going to describe the African American population and those are recaptured Africans and the Caribbeans. But in your mind, think of repatriates. So this is the repatriates. The immigrant population was about 10 to 12,000 and they were living mostly along the coastline. That's why you see today you have Buchanan, Clay Ashland, they're mostly on the coastline. So that is where they mostly settled along. And then you had the indigenous population that was more in the interior, uh, much larger in population. And so President, uh, President Coleman wanted to have a closer relationship with those in the interior. We, today we would consider Nimba, Lofa, Granjita, and Barpalu counties in, in Liberia. Uh, the country was also faced with being politically divided and lack of funds, and that political divisions is going to be exacerbated by colonial and exterior forces. Right. And that uh, you, you mentioned about the term American Liberian. They didn't call themselves like that at that time. And you said this was an outside term. Someone corrected me one time when I used it. They said, but where does that come from? Because when they so, were in America, they were not Americans. So let me just oh. say this. Let um, me just come in, Jabari, with the ethnicity issue. So it is accepted by the descendants of African Americans, this term American Liberian. You do see later on um, Howard using it in speeches. You see later on Charles D.B. King loved the term, even though none of his ancestors would have been considered American Liberian. So you had many, many people who then adopted it. And even today, you have people using the term, just like how people use the term crew, just how people use the term Vasa or Gio. A lot of these terms were imposed upon us and we just accept them. So it is a little bit of a sticky situation. I think it's important for us to know that it's not a term that was coined by the actual repatriated African-Americans, though their descendants now use the term in reference to their own ancestors. Mm -hmm. Just like if you would have told someone in the year 1790, a cloud speaking person that they were crude, they would have known that, hey, this is just something people call all of us on the coast because they call label people crew, they call Basa people crew, they call everybody crew, right? Along the yeah. Guinea coast. So now that becomes the terminology, the actual identity of the ethnic group. Um, so it's, 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 it's that, you know, even the term Madingo is not an organically African term, but we use it, you know, even though the language they speak is, is Malinka or Madinka, they don't say Madingo, but now everybody accepts that and calls themselves that with pride. So we have to be, walk a little bit of a fine line when we say, hey, this is a term that was imposed, but we now, we now, we're running with it. And why is that? I mean... Like, uh, for instance, the Man people now being called Mano or the Dam people being called Gio, 
they are rejecting those terms now. Said no well, Manu, Manu is not a new term, and that is not a non-African term. Manu just means my people. So that yeah. that's okay. I mean, before Liberia was established, when they mapped Kingdom Koya, they said the Kingdom of Manu, the Man people. So it that is that is actually the name of the people. Manu Nu is just what the Pella and others that were closer would refer to. Oh, those are the Man people. Right. Um now Gyo means slave. It, it's not it's not what their ethnic group is actually called. They don't call themselves Gyo when they're speaking their language. They don't call their language Gyo in their language. Um, just like when you're speaking Klao, you don't say Kru, mm -hmm. you know, and there's different dialects, you know, there's no R letter in our languages, so Brabo is not correct either. <laughs> so it's just a lot of things that we, we do. Um, I think it comes that's, that's with, with missionary right? education. It comes with missionary education. The missionaries are telling you who you are. You just accept it. Right. Crown don't call themselves crown. So what I'm saying is uh, that that's the same thing, right? Other people call you something, you just accept it and move with it. Because they, it, it's through the whole missionary education thing, right? So you, you get the missionaries are, are naming you, they're identifying you, and then you just accept it. The same thing happened to the descendants of the repatriated African-Americans. They get the missionary education. Missionaries are telling them, you are a miracle Liberian. Okay. I mean, why would you say no? They're teaching you. They're educating you about who you are. Mm -hmm. And a miracle Liberian is going to be an offshoot of African-Americans being called Anglo-Africans. Sometimes they're referred to as miracle Africans. So a miracle Liberian comes from that arena of, of lexicon to describe the african-american population right. and then the anglo-africans of course are the british most more more so than than american the anglo-africans are really the ones they're referring to in sierra leone nigeria gold coast the ones who have been anglicized um and they, they, this is an anthropological term it was just something that they did to differentiate uh, between what they considered to be civilized and not civilized as far as european anthropologists were concerned We'll yeah, use the term westernized. <laughs> and Charles David King, who parents came from West Africa, is calling himself a miracle Liberian, you say. Right. His his none of his ancestors were from the United States. He was not even born. He was born in Freetown. He was born in Sierra Leone as well. Well well actually, um, yeah, exactly. So yeah, so Central I mean he's a, he's the son of a recaptured Africans. And we'll get we'll get about Charles D.B. King when we get to Charles D.B. King. It's going to be a fun episode. Yeah, that's going to be so fun. <laughs> yeah. So so let's end with that before we leave. River says, proceed. How then did the settlers call themselves at that time? They, they just call simply called themselves Liberians. They call, <laughs> especially especially after 1847. I mean, you know, it was they were just Liberians, not American Liberians, not you know, Kentucky Liberians or Mississippi Liberians or Maryland Liberians, they were just Liberian. Right. They didn't they say, uh, they didn't say, they didn't use the word settlers or pioneers or immigrants, none of those? So when you're immigrating to the colony, immigrants with the E means you're, you're referring, you're in America referring to people leaving. Those people are emigrating to somewhere and immigrants are people coming to somewhere. They never called themselves immigrants. You know, it was, I'm emigrating to Liberia, and then now I'm Liberian. Right. Mm -hmm. So when I'm, when I'm coming out of America, I'm EMI. Yeah. Now, we get, now you get to Liberia, you are not calling yourself IMM. No, you're calling yourself Liberian. Basically showing that, hey, this is our home. We are oh, Africans. Yeah. This is where we belong. You cannot immigrate to your own home. Yep. So this is where we're really going to dive in because this is where um, a, a lot of stuff is going to happen. Um, yeah. This is also on this slide. It says uh, some ethnic groups have been at war since the mid 1880s. I like using the word ethnic group. Uh, oftentimes when you read historical documents, they will use the word tribe and tribe is not the correct way to refer to to people. It's usually associated with being barbaric and savage so it's better to use ethnic groups so there were some ethnic groups in the 1880s that were waging war and one prime example was the war between the gola and the um 
Mandingo people over trading routes in the region. So this was going on in the, in the north of the country, and there were various factions that were fighting, but they were also fighting amongst each other. So that also needs to be stated. And this, to clarify so people understand the time, this has been going on through Hillary R. W. Johnson's term and Joseph James Cheeseman. This is a continuation of their presidencies as we're talking about with inter-ethnic conflicts, as we did last year, last segment with the rebel conflict. So initially in 1897, President Coleman followed the example of his predecessors, like I stated earlier, it wanted to mediate through peaceful means. So they oftentimes held a conference. They said, hey, you know, let's come to a peaceful agreement, but that fails. When he failed to do a peace agreement between um, the main warring factions, they decided to resort to force. They would send ships, they would send troops to sort of quell the these uh, warring factions down. The, um, then they had the killing of Gola people by, Li by the Liberian military. It caused a lot of stir in Monrovia. Now, this is speculation. I'm not can say for sure, but there are some accusations that said that they favored one side over the other, that they favored the um, Mandinka people, Mandinka people over the over the Gola people. That's what some speculation say. Again, that's speculation. Um, when he so that happened, and then there was another attempt by Coleman to sort of have peace with the very ethnic groups in the region. But again, that's going to fail. And then he tried to get the Vi, the Gola, the Mandingo, and the Pele chiefs all together. And that didn't work. And then it ended up turning into a bloody conflict. So that's what's going to be happening in Coleman's administration. A lot of turmoil, a lot of inter-ethnic fighting. Right. So so here in this case, you said it, it, so it was Gola, Mandingo, for instance, the Gola people were not fighting among themselves. They were fighting Mandingo and vice versa. Yes, so, but there were also some sections fighting amongst each other as well. Right. So there's always been ethnic conflict, not always. Ethnic conflict in our region in West Africa has been exacerbated or was exacerbated originally by the, the slave trade. And when I say exacerbated, meaning there may have been conflict over territory and land as people migrate, but the slave trade made things worse. And the Goa people are very old in the area. Um, there was, before them, you also had the day who were displaced. In fact, the Gola were such a warrior group. They went in and literally um, almost committed genocide, almost eradicated the day people. Um, Getamba, who went in, fierce warrior, um, led his Gola forces uh, through day territory and basically whoever they could sell, they sold, whoever they could kill, they killed. And many of the remnants of the day sought refuge within the Liberian controlled territory. One of the things I want everyone to understand as Jabari does this presentation is that although there's a territory of Liberia, there are autonomous nations doing things that have nothing to do with Liberia. So Liberia is one of many nations within the Liberian territory. So you have many governments really even within the Liberian territory. You have the Liberian government, you have various chiefdoms and clandoms, you have, you know, different uh, uh, um, <coughs> ethnic groups that transcend these now artificial boundaries that didn't exist before the Berlin Conference. So you could have one continuous Madingo kingdom that is now partly under French control and partly under Liberian control or within the Liberian territory. You could have one continuous, which you did, not could, there was one continuous Vi kingdom partly under British rule and partly under Liberia, within the Liberian territory. You had a lot of stuff going on. So they partitioned these places and the conflicts were, are now transboundary. So one of the excuses and the reasons for them to fuel these conflicts is because they wanted to show that Liberia could not control its indigenous population. So if 
a war, a warring faction or a warring group in the Liberian territory cross this new boundary into Sierra Leone and attacked its ancient enemies <laughs> in Sierra Leone, this was considered an international uh, act of war, a transboundary act of war. And now the British have an excuse to retaliate against Liberia. Say, hey, your people are coming into our territory and committing murders, are committing atrocities. And so it worked in their favor. The more you destabilize and, and encourage indigenous warfare, the more you arm indigenous factions against one another, the more Liberia, you can make a case that Liberia cannot control its mm. population. And in fact, they wrote, they wrote this down, they documented and said, hey, you guys can't control these people, we'll take over for you. And this was some of the reason that they gave for trying to take over much of the hinterland is that you're not, you don't have the military to go in there and stop these wars. <laughs> we'll come and help you. We'll take it over. You guys can, can delegate yourselves to the coast. Jabari? Yeah, and, and to get to that point, a, a prime example of that is going to be. Um, this is going to be just towards the end of to uh, Coleman's administration, the Kavala River. The Kavala River is where you're really going to see that finalization of that border where originally from the Kavala River and San Pedro Rivers was Liberia. The French are going to claim that all those areas on the side of the Kavala River, the east side of the Kavala River, are all French. And the Liberian government is going to oppose that. And But... They, they, there's not much of enforcement that they really could do in that regard. So that is one example of, of the divide is the is going to be the Kavala River. Yes. Next. So I don't know, Jabari, were you done with the inter with the inter ethnic warfare part portion? Yes. Okay. So to emphasize what actually took place. It's important for us to look at the details. <laughs> um, you had the British colonial agent or governor, not agent, but governor in Sierra Leone, who had interest in taking uh, territory which goes well into Balmy, really. They really just wanted to take everything. And what is now Balmy? So you've got Cape Mount, Balmy, you've got what is now Balpulu. You have even all the way going up to what is, is um, Western Lofa, the Western boundary of Lofa in, in Sierra Leone. All those areas, that whole Gola Forest region. The British understood that this region, you can go to the next slide, Dennis. The British understood that this region was very rich in resources because they had been doing prospecting since the 1700s, the late 1700s. So they understood that there were vast gold and, and diamond deposits in this Gola Forest region. God forbid that they're going to let <clears throat> this little uppity bunch of Negroes on the coast control resources along with these Africans that they're allowing to run them up in their mindset, you know. They're letting these Africans, you know, it wasn't good for them to be controlling part of the Gola Forest where there's Kisi and 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 uh, Madingo and and Mendi and all of these ethnic groups on their side of the border that are now being subjugated under really strong subjection at this point. They're paying hut taxes. They have removed all of their traditional leaders. They have replaced them with their puppet chiefs. And at this point in history, Liberia has not done this. On the other side of, of the boundary, you've got the French doing the same thing. And, and simultaneously, the French have successfully conquered Samori Ture. So now they, the last you know, uh, uh, indigenous empire within the European controlled territory, which was Samori's empire, which he named Wosulu, is now being has now been destroyed. They've not imprisoned Samore. They have taken him to, to, to Gabon. They are they they have completely put the rest of West Africa under siege. 
Only the indigenous people in Liberia are governing themselves in their traditional way. Only the indigenous people in Liberia are not being subjected to a central authority. And this is serving also as an instigation to resist the European colonialists. Because they're like, wait a minute, our chiefdoms across the border are still functioning as they did. Nobody is forcing them to pay tribute to some white governor in Sierra Leone or some white governor in Chronically or some white governor in Abidjan. <coughs> Nobody's for it because at this point, there's no hut tax in Liberia. Because hut tax is a British, is a European creation. This is how mm -hmm. Europe subjugated and is subjected, really, and controlled the African, the Africans within their, their 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 territories. At this point, there's no paramount chiefs because that concept again is a European concept. It was the British that came in and made this up. Hey, here's our big man, and it was usually someone who wasn't really a traditional leader in a traditional sense. They really broke the society. So you have all of these uh, uh, traditional leaders in Sierra Leone being persecuted and being replaced by puppets, by puppet governments, puppet government, indigenous puppet governments. And they are saying, you know, Liberian government is now saying, we have to follow this model or they're gonna take away the, our territory. So this model is borrowed from our neighbors. This letter, um, th there's a, and I'll, what I'll do, I'm not gonna read these, but I, what I'll do is I'll post them in the comments after the show. But there's dot, letters upon letters where you see the British governor writing the Liberian government. Oh, our citizens within your territory are being harassed because they had you know, some, some British, supposedly British na nationals residing within Liberia, Sierra Leoneans. They're being looted, our missionaries are being harassed. And these missionaries were being sent in to instigate problems. So they'll send in something, pretend they're opening a school, they'll send these people in, they'll instigate conflict. The, 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 for example, it happened uh, in, 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 in Maryland where they sent these people in and then you have these, these, these grable people come, destroy the school, you know, damage everyone, but it was an instigated conflict. They didn't just do it out of thin air. It was because they were interfering with them. So you have this constant back and forth. And Liberia is under siege from all sides simultaneously. You've got the French and the British doing the same things. And it's so intense. The wars in the interior are so intense. The death toll is so intense. You're having a huge influx of I would use the word refugees because these are really separate nations coming towards the coast to seek refuge within the Liberian territory. Liberia has no frontier forces yet. This is going to come. This is going to come. So there's really just militias. There's no real military. And these militias are very weak compared to the indigenous militaries. You remember Samori Tour was able to defeat the French and hold these people at bay. So we talk about indigenous groups, these are very powerful uh, chiefdoms who are heavily armed and out armed the Liberians at this point. And some of Samore, tro uh, Samore troops are going to seek refuge in Liberia as the Wasala Empire collapses. Absolutely. So when, when Wasala didn't collapse, it was destroyed, right? So they, they also destroyed Wasala through the same infiltration. Because Samore was, the Liberian government was smuggling weapons or allowing mm -hmm. Samore to smuggle, they smuggle weapons to Wosulu so that they could defend themselves. When Samore was, was, was uh, finally betrayed by Africans fighting on behalf of the French, Africans wearing French uniforms and armed by the French, he retreated into Liberian territory where he thought he would be safe. He was captured in Liberian territory because everywhere else was completely controlled by Europeans. And when I talk about Samoa in our history, a huge number of our population are descendants of Wosulu. That last major migration, historic migration, 
of Madinka people came from Wosu. So there's been waves of immigration or, or migration. When Wosu collapsed, many of these warriors descended into the rainforest because they did not want to be either killed or incorporated or conquered by the French. So they came into Liberia to be free. So you have huge populations in Banga, Nimba, around Ganta, uh, um, Sekle Pie, places like this are descendants of people from Wosulu. And Corey, when they came... Mm -hmm. You said three different... You just said they came to Liberia to be free. Yes. Liberty. So this whole idea of Liberty freedom is, is not just say. people coming from the United States. Oh, no. I mean, you had... A, a, an empire, the last Madinka empire in West Africa was Wosu, was Samori Tour's empire. These people were profoundly successful and brilliant military. Samori Tour is one of the greatest military masterminds of all time, of all time, not just of Afri West Africa, not just of, of all time. The only reason the French conquered him is because they were able to use Afri other Africans who he had made enemies with to do so, arm them against him, use them to infiltrate. That's the only reason. But Wosu existed in resistance to the French. It, it, and we have we, we did a different show on that. I'm not going to get in that too much in sidetrack. But um, this was the period when these people had come into Liberia in great numbers. Mm -hmm. And... Some of that, now this is different from what's happening with the Gola. You do have a, a group of people that are in that area coming down, descending from where the French are, but there was all there were already Madingos in what is now Bomi and in those areas. Those that is not the same as the, the Wosulu descendants that came down and descended because of the, the capture of Samori <clears throat> Ture. Um so basically, the, the, just to quickly recap, these people were instigating these wars. If you go to the next slide. Right. I, I have two questions before I leave that. You okay. said, which is a complete contradiction when you say the missionaries were sent to Liberia and they were the ones fermenting the trouble. They were instigating things. Instead not, of not all missionaries. I'm saying the British sent these the, some the people one, the in. The British sent. Yes. So how, how you would have a Presbyterian that? church, for example, and and you know, so you had both British and Americans working in the same churches uh, as missionaries. You send some people, say, okay, you're going to go and be teachers. Well, a lot of these people were spies. The British were very good at infiltration. The people trusted the churches and the schools. They wanted the children to get educated, and so if you using these these mechanisms in order to incite people and drive a wedge between groups that already existed. It was masterfully done and they documented that they were doing it. So this isn't even <laughs> speculation. This is what they planned. This was their military strategy against Liberia. So they were missionaries instead of missionaries. Basically, you know, they were, they were uh, there to infiltrate and cause it, and, and widen the already existing rifts. And, for example, we talked about last episode when William Harris took down the, the Liberian flag and raised the, the, the British Union Jack, raised the British flag on Liberian soil and was arrested for doing so. Where did he get these ideas? He got these ideas from these people who were supposed to be his religious leaders. Told him, hey, these black people are bad. We are your saviors. We are good. So that was really what I mean. And so this is a constant theme. And this is this theme of telling Africans that they have come to save them when they've actually come to conquer them is older than 1822. This has been going on for a very long time to promote European interests, win the hearts and minds of people through religion, and then infiltrate this process with these people who are really there doing military things and not really God's work. So it, and it's a well-documented history right. all over yeah. Africa. But this is, you know, this is an intense, Liberia was 
under intense siege in, in many, many different directions. And the, 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 the evil thing about this is that they really thought that Liberians were, because, because what, what white supremacy and racism does to people, it makes them underestimate their targets. And from the beginning, they underestimated uh, Roberts, they underestimated, uh, I mean, everyone really. They underestimated people. At this point, they no longer are underestimating Liberia. By the end of the 19th century, they're like, you know what? These Negroes have beat us in court. These Negroes have gone and argued better than our lawyers have argued. They have gone to League of Nations. They've presented themselves well. They have humiliated us. So we are no longer going to underestimate them. We're going to hit them with everything we have. Uh, one, uh, you, uh, be before we go to the next slide, one thing that happens is there's a conference held um, in, in just at the end or right after Coleman's administration. And it was basically the French asking these indigenous communities, would you want to be under French rule or would you want to be under Liberian rule? And the Liber and the indigenous community were like, we don't want to be under French rule. We want to be under Monrovia and we choose to stay under the Liberian government. So that actually did happen to understand yeah. the state of, of, of loyalty to the Liberian, but also understanding what being under French control would mean. And, and this kind of thing is important to, to mention because this is documented where you have, in fact, we, I talked about the, the descent, the, um, the descent, the, the, the coming down into the rainforest of, of the Wosulu warriors <clears throat> with their weapons and their military skill because they were trained by one of the greatest warriors in human history, Samori Ture. These men, settled in Nimba, Lofa, and part of Bone County. When they needed to defend that territory against the French, these are the same people who joined with the indigenous warriors from those places to keep the territory that is still protruding into Guinea. That was not done by some treaty at some desk. That area, that Nimba and Lofa highland that reaches into Guinea, was maintained by blood and it was intentional. I want everyone to understand this today, that many of our warriors, along with the Wosulu warriors, who are now Liberians, joined together to defend the remnants of that Northern Territory. If not for them, Liberia would just be a slither along the coast. It wouldn't reach up beyond the northern edge of Bone County. Half of Nimba and half of Lofa would be part of Zerikore region in Guinea today. Mm -hmm. But they maintain that for Liberia. So that's important to mention. Um, it could be argued, it, it could be argued if it's not for those in northern Nigeria, I mean in northern in northern uh Liberia, it's really almost inevitable that they reach, not only reach the coastline, but they just take Liberia all out. They're just gonna go for the right. knockout punch. There's, there's some argument there too, that if it was not for, you know, this is one of the things that when I hear people talking about, when I hear people saying, oh, these Madingo people just came, blah, 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 blah. When I hear people saying that, I'm like, my God, history's so important. And a lot of the Madingo people, uh, people who call themselves Madingo, they don't know their own history either. Because if they knew it, they would, they would say it. Like, you know, my ancestors were warriors, some more too. I, didn't, I never hear my Madinka friends talking about Samori Ture and Wosul. That's not an accident. That is not an accident. They talk about both Swain, but they don't talk about Samori Ture and Wosul. And that is not an accident because if they understood that, it, and if even the descendants of recaptured Africans and African Americans and Basa and all of the ethnic groups, if we understood how much Liberia was under siege and what role everyone played to keep this place sovereign, we probably would not have destroyed it. We probably wouldn't have allowed people, ex external people to come in again and put bigger wedges between our little conflicts that we had and made us go into civil war and destroy one another.
if we knew our history, we would have never done that. And this is why it's important to talk about these things. Everyone looks at that map of Liberia. Nobody asked why half of Guinea, I mean, uh, Liberia, I mean, half of Nimba and half of, 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 of Lofa are sticking into Guinea. Nobody asked. Why don't you ask the question? There's an answer. And the answer is something to be proud of. So we can go to the next slide. Right. Also, Carl, one thing you said is uh, because what was going on in neighboring uh, what is now Sierra Leone, the British territory, that's why like the hot tax and mm -hmm. uh, the power achieved the governance structure. That's how it came to Liberia. I want you to throw a little bit of light on that. So, okay. So if you go to the next slide, it would be a good... Uh, uh, lead in for that, the one right after this. So this is just this was just to show the the colonial governors of Sierra <laughs> Leone. So this is one of many proclamations that President Coleman signed. Um, this is one of one of many proclamations that President Coleman signed, and this this proclamation basically I don't know if you can see it to read it. If you can, I would appreciate it. Mm -hmm. If you're able to see it. I, I can I can see it. My vision is very good. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I'll, I'll read it from uh, from the uh, screen here. Okay. A proclamation by the president of Liberia. Whereas certain evil disposed persons in the county of Grand Baza have threatened violence to British subjects and other aliens there residing, and whereas such conduct is contrary to the treaties in force between Liberia, Great Britain, and other foreign powers, by virtue of which treaties said persons are expressly entitled to the protection of the law. Hold on, I'm getting feedback there, so let me... Okay. Uh, entitled to the protection of the laws and have right to work at and prosecute their several callings in the Republic under the laws thereof. And where has any injury done to such strangers in person or property without warrant of law must be attuned for by the government of Liberia. Now, therefore, I, William David Coleman, president of Liberia, do and join upon all citizens to conduct themselves in a peaceable and legal manner towards such person and do hereby order all officers, judicial and executive to give them full and adequate protection for their persons and property. The government of Liberia will punish with the utmost severity any person wantonly injuring such persons in any way whatsoever. Given under my hand and the seal of the Republic this 10th day of June, AD 1899, and of the Republic the 52nd, by the President G.W. Gibson, Secretary of State, signed William D. Coleman, President. Okay. So this is Coleman's desperate attempt to exercise law and order in a situation where the conflicts and the crimes are being instigated by the very people he's trying to uh, defend. You see the you see the you see the, the the issue. You see what's going on. They are in Liberia causing conflicts in Liberia. And then telling the Liberian government, oh, you guys are lawless. You're failing to protect our citizens. And you, you're not able to govern yourselves. You Negroes can't control each other. But the conflicts that are happening are instigated by the very people who are complaining about them. So they're playing this kind of, uh, uh, what do you call it, head game warfare with Liberia. Psychological warfare. Psychological warfare. That's the word for it. They're playing this, this, this game on every front, on every level. 
So just before he responds, the colonial government of Britain writes him and says, these, these, you, you people aren't controlling these, these savages are running amok, they're killing our people. But the savages are them. They are the savages running amok in Liberia, causing conflict. And they have a history of doing it. And now you can go back and read, this was their plan. And they're, they're mocking us as we're falling into their traps. So now Coleman does this proclamation. He does not have a real military. When we get into, um, when we get into, you know, just after 1900, we're going to start talking about the how the British help conveniently create the frontier forces. But make sure that they put their own British soldiers in the frontier forces so that they can sabotage Liberia. They had plotted a coup. But we'll talk about that when we, we, in the future. But I just wanted you to know how conniving and vindictive mm. these people were. Mm -hmm. And side note on that before we get um, into the resonation is not only are you going to see the British get into it, you're going to start to see the Americans get into it, a.k.a. Charles S. Young is going to be the military officer in Liberia. So that's in the future, but it's just a side note. Yeah. Well, Charles Young actually comes in after the British try to sabotage Liberia. It's crazy. Stuff's gonna get so, I mean, when you when you look at this stuff and nobody should ask. And Dennis, if anybody who's been following the show from Roberts coming forward, there were, you know, they were, they were setting up all of these roadblocks and obstacles and, 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 and uh, booby traps for Liberia all along the way. Economic sabotage has been a theme from the very beginning. I mean, if you read Diary of an Economic Hitman, they came up with that strategy because of Liberia and Haiti. There's been an economic embargo and sabotage of Liberia from day one. But every hurdle that was put up to this point, we've jumped over. Liberia's jumped over it. And it continued miraculously. So now they're realizing, hey, these Negroes that we think are dumb are not dumb. They're outsmarting us. So we've got to hit them with everything we have. So this is not only internal conflicts being instigated, they're also hitting Liberia with economic sabotage. They're also cutting off trade routes for the indigenous leaders and their systems of government, their systems of substance are also breaking down. They're no longer able to trade over the border freely, freely like they were. So they're not only hitting the, the Liberian government on the coast, they're hitting all of the governments of the, the authorities within the hinterland as well. These autonomous governments in the hinterland are also being attacked economically from all sides. By the French in the north, by the British in the west, and by the French in the east. Because, the, and I want everyone to understand, they could not allow Liberia to function uninhibited because Liberia would have represented, Liberia was, was basically an affront to white supremacy. It was an affront to colonialism. If Liberia succeeded and was able to govern itself, it would send a message to the entire continent of Africa that they didn't need to be colonized. Yeah. Liberia was an affront to the European world order. So they were not going to allow Liberia to manifest its destiny by any means. And you later, I mean, coming even into the 20th, 20th century, yes. you got presidents in the United States that literally hate Liberia. And they're like, look, we need to put our own dictator there. We need to, you know, they Britain and France to... threaten invasion. They try to stop Garvey. They they do so many things. Everything, gonna... if you see, even J. Edgar Hoover, everyone gets into this. Everyone gets into this. We call this period the buck breaking of Liberia. This is where they are buck breaking the spirit of African self-determination. And they're not going to allow. They're not going to allow it. Because it's they gonna need get a whole lot It's gonna get a whole lot worse. It's gonna get worse from here forward. You're gonna start to see the Liberians. They, they they're doing this through churches. They're doing this through education, which is tied to the churches. They're building the curriculum. So they, they're planning things on so many levels. You talk about massive psychology. Being at war and not knowing you're you're being at you're at war is the most pathetic thing I've ever seen in my life. 
when you read this stuff. You read the British accounts, you read these people, what they're saying. They know they're fighting Liberia. Liberia doesn't know they're fighting Liberia. And that yeah. is so tragic to be at war and not even know you're at war. To I open up your gates, to open up the gates to enemy forces and not even know that they're your enemies. I want people to understand <laughs> before we get into his uh, uh, succession and, and talk about Liberia being handicapped. Liberia in the 1890s, in terms of a per capita income, based on, if we were looking at per capita income and we were supposed to do historical analysis, Liberia's per capita income was about 50 to 60 percent of what Japan's per capita income was in the 1890s. If Liberia doesn't get handicapped, get sabotaged, gets all of this, Liberia becomes the chief leader of the African continent and dictates influences on the African continent if it's not handicapped. Okay, I need you to understand just how significant Liberia was for its time. We eat in the 1890s. This is where you start seeing Henry McNeil Turner is somebody that goes to Liberia around this time of, of Johnson, of, of Coleman, of Cheeseman. We're having this. You still have African-Americans, some coming into the country at this time. So I need people to understand just how significant Liberia is at this time. And to answer somebody's question, because they asked a really good question um, that that we can go into. One of the questions that they stated was, could the argument be made that Coleman was compromised by his own Secretary of State, Garrison W. Gibson, and pushed out of the presidency? Right. And, and when we get to the next slide, after, then you can get into that, right? Yes. Because that's what's going to, um, that's partially going to happen. So Coleman is going to reside in 1900, and his policies are being questioned by people in the True Whig Party. And guess who some of his opponents were? Arthur Barclay, Charles D.B. King, and we got Garrison W. Gibson. And all of these men are going to become presidents after Coleman resigns. Gibson is going to take the throne. Then it's going to be Barclay. Then after Barclay, it's going to be Howard. And then you got King. So everybody of his major's opponents are going to take power after Coleman resigns. Hmm. That, that were all his opponents. That's interesting. And, and one of the things I want you to understand is so... These people are just genius. The, the story repeats itself throughout history. You're going to see it later on with Marias and these guys in Maryland. You're going to see it later on, even after that, with you know my late great in-law, Fombula. You're going to see it later on. Um, Tubman, um, Tubman fighting people. They also were masters of dividing the ruling class. You come in and you promise this group power. Coleman represented that last, and this is why I said this, this episode is so important. He represented that last uh, remnant of the original spirit of Liberia. After him, everyone is buck broken. Everyone's broken in. Everyone's railed in. Coleman represents that last spirit of resistance. He passed this on to his son and his grandson. This man was a 33 degree Mason from that old school. And he was also born into slavery in the United States. He was deported from his country of birth to Liberia, deported back to Africa from the place where he was born. He was not afraid to die. And I had said this to Jabari once and he thought it was funny, but I said, I wish I could go back in time and tell Charles D.B. King and these, 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 these presidents 
that everybody's going to die eventually anyway. Don't be afraid. <laughs> Everyone, the worst thing that you're afraid of is going to happen anyway. Yeah. Don't be afraid. If I could go back in time and show these guys what their cowardice was going to produce in the future, maybe they would have been courageous like Elijah Johnson, like Daniel B. Warner. But it is what it is. It happened. So after Coleman is when you're going to start seeing the beginnings of Liberia behaving like the colonial powers because now they're being coached and trained and coerced into doing what their neighbors are doing. Mm. And this was not what any of their predecessors had in mind. And Coleman does run again. He runs again as part of the People's Party and he's going to lose. So once Coleman resigns and he tries to, that's really the end. That's when we see Garrison W. Gibson take power and afterwards and they the, go. The, and the beginning of rigged elections. Yes. yes. So Coleman is the last actually Democratic elected president for a very long time. For a very long time. After this, you've got the, the European and American forces literally handpicking the, lead, the leaders of Liberia. And that, that, that is so much to support this. Because the People's Party, you have so many indigenous Liberians and uh, um, uh, what do you call it? Indigenous Liberians who, who were citizens and recaptured Africans who were citizens. I find it very hard to believe that Coleman lost that election. But that's a different conversation. And, um, and it, it's a valuable speculation because the People's Party is sabotaged for decades to come. It's Coleman. It's going to be Faulkner when, once we start getting into King. The People's Party of Liberia gets constantly sabotaged. And it's not just them. You have the independent Truig Party that's going to come later on that's going to get sabotaged. All the people who are going to start opposing that, that buck breaking, they're going to get silenced. They're going to be taken out. Hmm. So the strong arm of the True Work Party did not begin with Tubman. Mm -mm. No, it goes, it goes decades early. Again, what does Liberia have a Guinness of the World Record? This is something that if you don't know, Liberia has a Guinness Book of World Record, and you know what that record is? CDB King. <laughs> yep, the most fraudulent election in history and, and this this is where it starts and then they want to make it look like it was charles who who rigged the election we know who rigs the elections in liberia right they've got they've declassified so many papers that that point to this they're in control they didn't even have the respect to do the numbers right but they they hand pick people after this so mm -hmm. what i want you to see here is william david coleman from Kentucky. And the, the two Kentucky presidents were radical, right? You, you had Russell, Russell, who, who was the whitest president, he was, I would say, whiter than Roberts. Russell was radical as heck, right? Now you've got Coleman, who's from Kentucky. He's not mulatto, but he's also got that Kentucky spirit because the way they were treated in Kentucky <laughs> stayed with them. They had that spirit of resistance and resilience. But when your entire country, your entire people that also share power have bought into this, you know, oh, we don't want these people to crush us. We just want to get along. And you know what? If we play our cards right and we don't fight the world powers, we'll be comfortable. Our children will be comfortable. You know, to hell with the rest of the country. Hmm. We got to get ours. If we go join Coleman, they will, they will step on. All of us will suffer. That Coleman goes sit down with a radical self. Our, our grandfathers then, they had these ideas, but the world has changed. Africa is now colonized. We got to get with a program. And if we don't pretend to be colonizers, we will be colonized. If we don't do the work of the colonizers, if we don't serve as a proxy puppet government for the colonial powers, then we ourselves will be crushed. So now you have this Liberia becomes just like the system of paramount chiefs among the indigenous people, Liberia now becomes a proxy for mm. Europe and America. 
so, so the government of Liberia. So Kono was kind of pressurized. Uh, let, let's talk a little bit more about why he resigned, because they are telling him, you know, accusing him of using excessive force. Also, uh, that his uh, his policies, his native policy, was being questioned. Let, let's talk a little bit about that. Those two reasons. So when it comes to when it comes to mainly his opponents, his opponents want him to take sort of a previous kind, but they don't like the way that he's responding. They they think that, oh, you know, it's too forceful. You know, you kind of need to work it out. And, and Coleman is saying, um, do y'all see what's going on here? Like, we're being attacked on all sides. Uh, it's this kumbaya is what, what I would say. It's the kumbaya mentality. Let us all get along. You know, let's have, this is why they, Coleman even has a place, let's have this more open policy towards these communities. That, that's why he tries to make those statements because it's that kumbaya mentality that they want to bring. But Coleman doesn't want to do that. Coleman is seen as a very progressive man. And so he's considered a threat to the vanguard. That old vanguard or that, that, that status quo that wants that kumbaya mentality. So they tell Coleman, you got to bounce. You, you, you got to bounce <laughs> and, 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 you can't, and you can't come back. You, you, you got to. Exactly. We saw... And, and really, all they've done is promised, you know, they go in, they have these conversations with each of the legislators, all of these other prominent Liberian political figures, and they say to them, hey, my man, you know, we, the Coleman guy is raining on our parade. Do what we want you to do. We're going to make you president one day. And we're also going to make sure that you have all of your business interests protected and you will be successful. But you, you can't fight. You can't fight this fight. You can, there's no way you can win. So, you know, they gave in. And I want to say also, I want to say also this with, with, with Coleman and I don't know too much about Gibson like that, but I'm going to say this. Coleman is that last generation of what we call the American, the really the African American generation, those who were born into slavery or those who experienced slavery, experienced or lived in a country while slavery was right. Yeah, reconstruction. This is where we see sort of that last generation. Afterwards, all the Liberian presidents are going to be, of course, they're going to be born in Liberia, but their experiences are going to be much different. And so I need people to understand it because how a generation is raised is going to shape that generation. It's exactly. similar. It's similar. How they're educated. Yes. How they're educated. And this is why we and talk about the state, how they're educated and socialized. And who's doing the educating? Who is doing the educating? Because when Elijah Johnson and these people were educated, they were educated by these liberation, black liberation theologists. Most of the educators of free blacks in the United States were black liberation theologists. So they were building in these people a spirit of confidence, of self-respect, of dignity. What happens is when Liberia doesn't have the resources because of the economic sabotage to really, to really build schools, they then, because they're Christians, open up for these churches to come in. And these churches come in and they're coming in also almost like a Trojan horse. It's a Trojan horse, this process of missionary education and missionary schools. You start having these people come in and they're educating not only the indigenous children, but the children of the elite. Everybody's going to the same schools. And they are teaching them. They're, a, they're, a cult, they're, they're indoctrinating them in this anti-African ideology. They're even indoctrinating African-born indigenous children in anti-African ideology. They're teaching them the false pseudo ideology of white supremacy through the church schools. They're skewing history lessons. They're teaching them that everything that Africa has ever done is barbaric and everything Europe, Europe has ever done has been enlightened and great. They remove Africans out of the human, uh, the process of human enlightenment and human social development. They erase the Black Moors of Spain. They erase 
the great kings of West Africa. They start teaching these people that everything African is savage and bad. And this is the new way to look at it. Mm -hmm. And that's why, and that's why after Coleman, especially, you're going to start to see the, a lot of Liberian presidents stop advocating for African-American immigration or say we want a certain type of black person to come into Liberia. Because prior to, and it, that's why we emphasize these generations in the background, when you're born into slavery and you see slavery and you witness all of this, okay, it, it radicalizes you. It fundamentally changes you. These Liberians who are born in Liberia and who are getting educated by these missionaries, they have not seen slavery. This is after slavery. They have not seen the, uh, the, the cruelties of slavery or even reconstruction. They haven't seen that. So their approach is more accommodationist, which is why later on, as more African-Americans want to migrate there and they're much more radical, they want them to keep at bay. They, want to, they don't want them to come anymore because now they're going to see them those radicals who carry the vision of the Elijah Johnsons, of the Coleman's and Roberts as a threat. Mm hmm So. So. Basically, um, I'm sorry, let me get to the slide. So basically Coleman, under this tremendous pressure from European powers, um, and instigating, I'm sorry, from the legislature instigated by European forces, Coleman now resigns. And I also want to point out something. The only reason Coleman wasn't murdered <laughs> is, is because Coleman was, um, was extremely uh smart when it came to knowing the danger he was in they murdered ej roy they murdered benjamin jk anderson he was shot benjamin jk anderson the, the hero that went to musadu twice was murdered they tried to murder Edward Wilmot Blyden, and he escaped to Sierra Leone, where he lived until he, he died. So <laughs> the, the fact that Coleman wasn't murdered, for me, is, is, is just like, wow. Because many people that came, maybe because they murdered those other people, he knew what to do. And his fighting spirit and his uh, strength, his courage, is something he's gonna pass on to his children. But when Coleman okay. resigned in 1900, and because there was no vice president to Coleman, uh, Garrison uh, Warner Gibson was chosen to succeed him. So old man G.W. Gibson takes over, and he's the one there with the white top hat in the middle, right in front of the flags. I don't know if you can see how, how big people can see the picture, but. Uh, that's that's uh, Gibson. That's actually on his, his inauguration in 1900. Uh, he's surrounded there by the militia because there's no frontier forces yet. You want to blow it up? Can you do that, Dennis? Or if you just yeah. Anyway, um, so that's 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 him standing there with his hands on an umbrella. It looks like a cane, but it's really an umbrella, and he's surrounded by all of these uh, very uh, these men with all these rifles. So that this photograph for me marks the end of an era and the beginning of another. This is that turning point, 1900. This is where we're going to see the Liberia that we recognize, <laughs> the chaos that we recognize to be Liberia. I know when I started the series, aside from Roberts, people said, Oh, why are you glorifying these people? Why? Well, because it was the truth. And stories have to be told in chronological order. You cannot read history backwards or you will not understand or be confused. You have to read it forward in chronology. So this is now, we are going to literally flip the script going forward um, until we stop at um, Howard. I know we're gonna, where are we stopping? Are we stopping at Howard? Or are we gonna go all the way to Edward Barkley? Yes. I mean, Edwin Barkley. So we'll go all the way to the second President Barkley. Um, yeah, so you're going to see the difference in the shift. And now, you know, the narrative is going to change because the mindset of the people has, is now, this is, this is the, 
changing of the guard. So, as far as yeah, so I want to there's this. some other additional reasons. Of course, this is policy, but also his he says to properly communicate to his members of his cabinet, among who was Secretary uh, Gibson and Arthur Barclay. So we see there's turmoil in his own administration, people in his administration turning their backs on him. Um, they said they did not know his intentions and his plans, and they had difficulties explaining it. So you can see there is this dysfunction in his administration and that's going instigated. to instigated yeah. well instigated well instigated and well orchestrated and of course as we see here he's going to distance himself of the prevailing policies from fellow true Whig partisans so we see he's going to go against what the true Whig party says and this is what happens so we can go to the aftermath so again, um, you know, True Whig Party policies have always been extremely radical up until this point. I mean, you talk about E.J. Roy and his mindset. It was really about Black self-determination, economic sovereignty, fair trade, not only with the, the people uh, uh, on the coast, but also with the people in the hinterland. This was True Whig Party policy. And so it is not really Coleman who went against True with Party policy. It's True with Party that flipped the script on itself, on its founders. Their mentality started to change. So the narrative doesn't make sense because if you look at what Roy did and what all of these people did before that got them into trouble, that was the fighting spirit that had continued through Coleman. So it's not that he he wavered from what True Whig Party did. It's that the members, the majority of True Whig Party people, flipped the script on who they were, and lost track of who they were, and 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 you know did what was easier to do, which is to 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 cave in to the the, the forces and the powers that be. Right. And as I said, you know why do that? Everybody's going to die anyway, eventually. <laughs> yeah. So. so so Coleman resigns. He, he doesn't have a vice president at this time because the vice president dies, right? Yeah. yeah. And uh, the uh, the rule is he should be, so the third president should be the speaker. But now is uh, Garrison, who is the secretary of state. I think there were some changes there. I want you to kind of explain about that a little bit. He was handpicked. Oh, go ahead, Jabari. Yeah, I was about to say, when we talk about how speaker, how that's usually... Um, Obviously, that's based off the U.S. model, um, but in that, in this particular situation, um, it's, it wasn't the Speaker of the House. Um, it was Garrison W. Gibson, which I kind of would make that would make sense because he was part of the cabinet. Um, you know, and when you have presidency, you have the president, the vice president, you have the Secretary of State. So um, that that kind of makes sense why they would go to the Secretary of State. But um, yeah, Garrison and Liberia, was, Liberia's original government structure is modeled off of a state not off of the U.S. federal government. So that's important to also note. People get that confused. <clears throat> um, so we can go to the next slide. And this is where uh, William, so William David Coleman died in 1908. Um, he basically retired. He kept, he not really retired. He kept trying to be president. He kept he organized the People's Party. Um, very, very, this is his son's photo, by the way. This isn't him. But he 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 organized uh, the People's Party, and he was able to. Um, the People's Party comprised of majority indigenous and recaptured Africans, a lot of you know average Liberians, um, who were who were living you know were being Westernized and were educated and. Uh, they were they were they were they were basically carrying the torch of the old True Whig Party, the People's Party. Um, his son Samuel David Coleman was also involved in politics, and you know he had his son and his grandson who had his fighting spirit. Um, they were killed by government forces on June 27, 1955. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot that can be said. But Samuel David Coleman 
was his father's son. Samuel David Coleman was his father's son. He wanted to run for president. He believed that President Tubman was a puppet. He believed that President Tubman was um, basically a proxy ruler for Western imperialism. To paraphrase what he actually said. And he felt that President Tubman was only um, ruling he was only helping Liberia as much as the West would let, allow him to, but everything that he was doing was in the interest of external forces and not internal. So even though during the Tubman administration, there was a lot of progress compared to previous administrations because he was cooperating with the powers that be. So they were allowing him to, oh, we'll build you a nice hospital. We'll build you this. Oh yes, we'll let you pave roads. And Tubman did a lot, but at the same time, at, at what cost? Coleman was like, listen, we can still do these things, but they need to be trading with us fairly. They need to be, you know, it can't just be we're giving 90 percent. They're giving us back 10 percent. Mm -hmm. This is not fair trade. This is not a fair exchange. I don't care how many hospitals they build for us. We need to be in a position to do it for ourselves. And it shouldn't be that we're you know, in a beggar master relationship. So Coleman had his father's spirit. Whether or not he really tried to overthrow the government, I don't know. Tubman says he tried to kill him. Try to. There's a whole book he wrote. I, there was a book I don't believe. Him. I don't believe a single. One. My him. my personal two cents on that. I don't believe a word that Tubman said because we know Tubman was on some chicanery and on some buffoonery. <laughs> so I believe. I believe Tubman got rid of him. Listen, Tubman was listen, very. Tubman, Tubman, Tubman is my favorite dictator in African history. But that's a different that conversation. Man lived, but that man was 27 <laughs> whole, two, nearly three decades of Liberian history. And the original president, it was only eight years at max. And this man said, I'm going to triple that. I'm going all in. So, and, and he was kept there because that's what they wanted to do. That's what they wanted to do. They wanted a dictator that they could, that, and the longer he's there, the more stable their policies are. Right. So, I mean, Tubman was, a, was the, the prototypical dictator. All dictators in Africa, Bobutu Sisizuku and, 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 and Idi Amin Dada, all the dictators in Africa are Tubman clones. <laughs> you know, Robert Mugabe, everybody was a Tubman clone. Everybody wanted to be like Tubman because he was he was he was the prototype for dictator African dictatorship. I mean, he he did it best, but all jokes aside. I don't know what happened. I wasn't there. When we talk about history, we cite sources and we say right. this is what they said. Right. They well, said, but, there, but there's no source that 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 give any facts that uh, this man was trying to overthrow Tub Tubman. I mean, they have the gun. They had you know different plot co-conspirators. I mean, you had Dunbar. You had uh, um, uh, they said Barclay was part of it. <laughs> I mean, you've got they they had I mean they had a whole case against this guy. This wasn't a joke. I mean, one of the guards for President Tubman was even shot but survived miraculously, right? Mm -hmm. But these are trained, these guys used to be up in Clay Ashland shooting stuff, practicing, you know. So you trying to kill somebody, you know how to Coleman, you know, Samuel Samuel was his father's son. He knew how to shoot. So <laughs> these guys grew up. I mean, they could hunt. They could shoot a squirrel from yards away. So for them to shoot Tubman's bodyguard and only nip him a little bit, I don't know. You know, that's what they yeah. said happened. But so at the end of the that, day, yeah, they, they went to his house to get him because, you know, they were going to arrest him. And he's like, I'm not getting arrested. We're going to die today. So Coleman and his son pulled out their weapons, and they were like, we are going to die today because they were born with that spirit of we have no fear. And they opened fire on these government forces when they went to Clay Ashton to pick them up. And then Coleman and his teenage son did not survive, of course. They also took out a lot of government uh, 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 military people who went there to arrest them. And they took a lot of them out. They died. And then Coleman, Samuel Coleman and his son, you can go to the next slide, are buried in Clay Ashland next to William David Coleman. Um, their graves are right next to their patriarch's grave. And may their souls rest in peace. 
I, I wonder how this grave look now because I have a friend in Monrovia this week who was describing the grave side of your favorite president. President Warner? Michelle Warner. And she was say. crying. If you're, if you're listening to this, if you're listening to this, and you can go and clean Daniel B. Warner's grave, I hold your foot. Go mm -hmm. and clean Daniel B. Warner's grave. He's one of it the greatest. It is an atrocity. It is an atrocity. He's one of the greatest people that has ever, ever um, served as president of Liberia. Daniel Bashir Warner deserves respect. Um, Daniel B. Warner. That's a, that's Born a in the United of... States, son of recaptured Africans, Daniel B. Warner, please go and clean his grave. There's a reason that when he died, he was so respected that they put his body in a garden. They put his grave in a garden. They didn't bury him at Palm, I mean, uh, at Palm Grove Cemetery. They buried him prominently, put a garden around his grave with benches for people to be able to go and sit and reflect on his life and his contributions to the African world. Daniel B. Warner, the shipbuilder, Daniel B. Warner, the advocate for economic justice for Africa, one of the first advocates for economic justice for Africa, and Daniel B. Warner, um, his, his, his memory should be respected. His remains should be respected. So if you're listening and you got nothing to do, y'all please go clean the man grave. All right. All right, let me, let's, uh, thank you. Let's get a few comments here. Let's get a few comments from our readers and also our listeners, you can call to be part of the conversation, 605-313-6004. The code is 791403-POUND. River says, Pro, say, our former president were not formally educated, but rich. Now you ridicule our pres present leader for not knowing how to speak English. I want you to speak to them. Say our former presidents were not formally educated. River says pro. Well, so there are a lot of presidents that were not formally educated in the 19th century. You got to understand this is the 19th century. This is not 2021 or two where we have criteria and standards like that. So just to say also, they were rich. Also, yeah, Jabari, it's not even that. I would just say really quickly, uh, River says, um, Coleman was educated. Coleman spoke well. Coleman understood the world and he did his job to the best of his ability. And he understood global politics and he defended Liberia. He did not pander to the West. He did not, you know, bestow honors upon his football coach. He did not disgrace the country. Do not make that comparison. Um, you're my dear brother, but that that's absurd. You cannot compare, um, you know, even Samuel Dole, who wasn't formally educated, conducted himself with dignity. He wasn't killing people. Uh, Opa Dualu says, so the argument that Labro was not colonized is not entirely true. And, it is true. And what are you basing that on? I, I don't know what you, if you can give more context. Michael Mangere, thanks for clearing up the whole indirect rule mode of governance. We resorted to it under the imperial duress of the British and French. Yeah, pretty much. Haruna says, it is very important to emphasize the foreign policy and why our leaders took a certain tactical or radical approach to beat the English and the French. We didn't beat the English and the French. Not really. I mean, when you say our leaders, you know, the time that the French and the British were beat was about the territory. And that occurred right after Wolfsburg fell. And at anything, anything after that, anything after that, you start getting into um, economic sabotage, economic, indirect economic uh, control. And that, that's where we are, uh, you, you know. Um, so the, the European and the American forces are, are up to today, and it's even worse today than it was during Charles Luther King's time, the economic um, control and, and uh, sabotage of Liberia continues. So when I say we didn't beat the French, I mean economic, you know, as far as our economic sovereignty is concerned, our land sovereignty is still intact. Master says it's important for Carl to explain a bit <laughs> on the involvement of specific church groups from England. And mass somewhere, Massa, we were talking when you were talking about that, they, they sent 
missionaries or Liberia, whom I was referring to as mercenaries, she wanted to also know the denomination of those missionaries. All of them, the Methodists, the Inland Church, the Presbyterian, the Catholic, all of them were participating in the same, um, in the same indoctrination process. Not only in Liberia, but all over Africa. And it, it doesn't mean it doesn't mean that every missionary was not there sincerely to spread the word of Christ, um, to spread the word of God. It means that all of the church groups were also so two things can be true at the same time. Two di you know diametrically opposed forces can operate in the same time in the same space. So while you had people who were sincerely baptizing people and there to win souls and there to teach little black babies how to read and write. You also had the overall arching that indoctrination process to westernize you and turn you against yourself. Our next here is from Haruna Keita. The French are still playing the game with West Africa, using African puppets to get the rest of Africa. We are repeating history. See what happened to the money echo. Ejume mm -hmm. is uh, getting emotional. A uh, regular thing. <laughs> McGarry, could the argument be made that Coleman was compromised by his own Secretary of State, G.W. Gibson, and pushed out of the presidency? Haruna said, this is why I love Tudman. Smith, that we Connor is well informed on Liberian history and very impressed with her knowledge of our rich culture. Thank you. Continue. These messages should be taught in our schools. Please help us. Um, and Haruna, who loved Thomas, said, This is why I get a bit angry when Todma is not acknowledged by these so called pan African guys. It's a double edged sword with Todma. It's a double edged sword with Todma. Todma walked the line. I always say, he Walked the line. He walked that line, boy. <laughs> he walked the line. It's I wish that the civil servants, especially those in the foreign ministry, know this history. I wish those carving or craving for foreign policy or carving our foreign policy and involving our educational system are aware of this rich history. Amen, Dr. Padrigo. Unfortunately, that's not a problem for our people. Dr. Padrigo for president. <laughs> don't, don't be done. That's what we need. That's what we need for president. Somebody will understand that. That would be great. Uh, Michael said, I would end at Edwin Barclay, my people. Tudman would need a whole section for himself. His presidency is too well documented. Yes, and so we made We never intended to do Tudman. Yeah. They already did Tudman, right? Um, uh, what's his name? Dr. Toll. Dr. Uh, Toll did Dr. His... Toll for Tudman. Yeah, Dr. Toll, Dr. Toll did his doctoral thesis on Tudman. The Tevin Ford Coma is a surviving ancestor of former President Coma. He played for the New York Jets. A surviving descendant, not ancestor. Yeah. <laughs> is a surviving descendant. I was like, what? You got ghosts playing? <laughs> <laughs> Who we were to when you were talking about Robert Mugabe? So. All of them, all of them are Tubman protégés. Every but, but they didn't do it as well as he did it. None of them did it as well as Tubman did it. <laughs> all right. So those are those are uh, those are some of the comments we 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 have. Yes. I see the historical thread why West Africa cannot be a united whole, not even economically. What kind of question? Wait, I, I don't, I don't agree with that. I'm just gonna say I don't agree with the question. Uh, he just said uh, it was specific for Cal, but he says, "Do you think is it? Do you think is right for America can intervene in our domestic affairs?" I mean, it's 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 um it's a form of of it's it's a breach of your sovereignty for any foreign country to interfere. But the um, Liberia has been so buck broken that we beg for it. <laughs> <laughs> We've been so buckbroken that that our elected officials go and protest to the U.S. Embassy. I mean, it's the biggest joke in the world. Yeah. Nobody in the world does that. 
sanctioned. Like, I mean, you got people, people getting sanctioned by the U.S. government because they don't like what. What are we doing? Like, why? Like, we. That's, ask that's not even. Listen, let me let me ask. Is what's his name? Fred Johnson. Fred. We had an issue with with the CPP framework, and they were saying that people couldn't run on the party ticket. And our elected officials, our senators and representatives from Unity Party, got together and walked to the U.S. Embassy in protest. Liberty Party. Was it Liberty Party or also Unity yeah. Party? All the people that were that didn't that wanted to be able to run on the party ticket. At that moment. At that moment, I realized that, you know, all is lost. <laughs> it's really going to come, I, I tell people this then, is really going to come from the diaspora. <laughs> I mean, and then, and then another thing that happened again was uh, recently, you know, you had, uh, uh, I mean, you got every, even the, the, the president is pandering and, you know, kind of performing for the West. Oh, look yeah. at me, America. Oh, look, I'm, you know, I mean, it, they're not even... He's not even serving the citizens. He's serving the West. His focus is on the West. His focus is on America. His focus is on these other countries. They go to the World Cup. They're waving. His wife's wearing the American flag while she's the first lady, a budgeted first lady for our country that has a tax budget, an allocated budget for Liberia, wearing the American flag at an international venue. I don't care if you yourself claim you don't do that. You can support your son and respect the position you hold. Let's, then, let's add even more. Let's add even more because I've been diving into Liberia's voting and um, it's foreign policy. And every time you have Liberia one, vote, it is voting on the side of the Western United States. Look at what they did with the state of Israel. They asked, should Palestinian human rights abuses by the Israeli government be investigated should it be the obvious answer if we was truly a sovereign country would be yes israel's an apartheid state and those palestinian those palestinian human rights abuses need to be investigated you had the liberian government one of the, a few african countries that said nah nah every other majority african government voted Yes. Even even the the most backward of African countries that we like to mock that Liberia would should be in a position to teach understood what to do. Liberia had always advocated for justice. We no longer do that. Hmm. Now we just look to see, Big Brother, how you voting? Okay, I will vote like that too. Well, we don't even I, think exactly, for ourselves exactly. anymore. And, and let me give you an example. According to the president, our current president, we are, he said, Louis Brown was fired as his ambassador uh, to the UN because he did not vote with the United States. <laughs> I mean, we had previous presidents that would tell the United States, hey, you're breaching UN sanctions against South Africa. We had Colbert stand up and tell the American government that, hey, you're breaching sanctions that the United Nations agreed upon because South Africa is oppressing Black people. And now we have presidents of the same country saying you have to vote exactly like America votes, even if it's against yeah. the interest of your citizens. So we're no longer functioning in the interest of Liberian citizens as leaders. That's what's happening. And it's open. I mean, here you've got Jimmy Eastman saying, oh, everybody interferes in everybody's politics. That is, the word interfere is one thing. It is, there's nothing comparable to what's being done in, in these smaller powerless, uh, economically uh, <laughs> broken, uh, 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 resource-rich plantation states we call African countries. There's you just can't even, no, I, nothing, you can't this. compare that. You can't I mean, it, 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 it's, it's to not even understand global politics or global, global economy, economics. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's crazy to, to compare this. Even the biggest nation interferes. I can't, can't even compare them. It's not the same thing. Them. You can't even compare to African states because at least in countries like Mali, Guinea, Burkina Faso, they are putting up a fight. You see what no, they're Guinea's doing? No, Guinea's not putting up a fight. Yes, yeah. they are. Mali's doing something. Mali's doing Guinea? something. Guinea with their puppet president, I beg you. I don't agree the with you. The Guinea people are doing something. Now they leadership. The Guinea people doing Gu something. Guinea, Mali, Guinea has always stand up. But, but let's let's let's. Guineans are, are 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 fighters, but their president their president was yeah. was handpicked. 
yeah, yeah Alpha Conde yeah. and, and then that other mm-hmm. stuff. Yeah, that. Mm-hmm. Let's let's wrap it up tomorrow at 12 noon. A new day will be here on the topic society and women. Our friend Priscilla J. Nanto is going to host uh, May Azango. This is a journalist uh, her bo- uh, article on... Uh, anyway, let me not go there. And then Seattle Scott Johnson, who is the president of the Female Journalists Association. They will be here with Priscilla to discuss society and women. You don't want to miss... A new day. Also at six, hello, Pastor. Our new show where we talk about the Bible with uh, Reverend Dr. Chandler G. Freeman answers some biblical questions. Tomorrow we're going to be talking about the Bible. Is it the Word of God? Who wrote it? Who compiled it? Well, there are some other books that were left out. Are there some inaccuracies and inconsistencies or mistakes in the Bible? Why are there so many versions? <coughs> Are there 66 books or 73 books? I think the Catholic has 73. Um, other Christians have 66. What's true about the Bible? You don't want to miss. Hello, Pastor, with your host, Dennis. That's me. Well, thank you, Carl. Thank you, Jabari, for the presentation tonight. I want to thank our viewers at this time. Let's uh, wrap it up. Jabari, let me get your closing, and then we go to Dr. Pamela, Dr. Padua. Calls all the residents color. All right, let's close. My my closing statement is: we have to do better. We have to continue their legacies. We have to learn more about them. They did not do what they did for us to be in the situation we are in, being the absolute dumpster fire. So it's time for us to really live their legacy, learn about them, and uh, continue that legacy. We are the living embodiment of that. Thank you, Carl. Yeah, so um, I think it's important for us to realize that I think this this episode, hopefully, it, it, if you watch it from the beginning, you realize the tremendous pressure, organized, orchestrated, psychological, economic, physical, violent warfare that has been waged against Liberia to prevent its success. You will not succeed as a country if you don't acknowledge and recognize what has happened to get us where we are. You cannot fix a problem you don't understand. I hear other people say, oh, Liberia, okay, Liberia can't even do this. Liberia can't even feed itself. Liberia can't even do this. Yes, Liberia can. There's a reason we're in the position we're in. This is how we got there. And now that we know what happened, we can fix it. The reason they bury your history is because the solution to the problem lies in the problem, the origins of the problem, the way the problem is structured. You cannot solve something you don't understand. So when someone wants to destroy you and weaken you and break you, they bury your history and replace it with confusion and lies. I hope that following this, you're going to get some clarity and understanding about how we got to where we are so that we can now make a plan to move forward and correct it. Thank you so much, Carl. On that note, we want to uh, close the broadcast tonight and say thank you all for coming. Uh, There are a few more questions coming, (laughs) but we're going to end tonight. Our next episode will be the next president. That's the president number 14. And you don't want to miss that. We still, if you don't already know, of course, we talk about the one who succeeded President Coleman, that's Garrison W. Gibson. So be ready next Saturday or the other Saturday. And we're trying to kind of, we are trying to kind of uh, change the schedule a little bit and we'll let you know if we're going to do every Saturday or continue with our every other Saturday. But, so uh, the presidential it. series is going to be every other Saturday. Yeah. And again, I'm going to invite Jabari <laughs> for Gibson. Next Saturday, we are going to, so in between the presidents, we're going to have different topics. And we're just going to try that for a couple of weeks and see how it works. Um, So next week, I will be on here with uh, Brother Kofi. um, And he and I are going to talk about uh, disinformation and, and basically disinformation and the disinformation campaign against Liberia. Is the, is the topic that he's researching, not only on social media, but everywhere. 
And uh, he's been compiling a lot of information about how a lot of the people who are pushing this disinformation agenda against Liberia are uh, European and American scholars uh, who are, are not even scholars, but internet bloggers. Um, most of them belonging to white supremacist organizations, which is very interesting. So we're gonna you know, kind of expose a lot of that next week so that people understand why when you Google Liberia, you just see nonsense. They still hate the Republic. <clears throat> That's uh, that's um, well to tell you that uh, the Liberian History Channel is going strong. We've been bombarded to do this almost every day. We wish we had a capacity, <laughs> but um, Not as possible. Paul is driving this, we're going to be doing this every Saturday. But the Saturdays in between, we're going to do different topics and continue with the presidents until the end of that presidential series. And uh, if you are enjoying this, uh, feel free to give drop us a line. Or you can send us a message, or you do a video, you know, yeah. and let other people know what we are discussing here about the Library like, History Channel. Thank you again, Carl. Thank you, Jabari. Yeah. And we want to thank our viewers for always tuning in. You know, the day you stop learning is the day you die. So continue to be here and learn. Let's learn together. I was a very, and I want to use myself as an example, very good student in Labra, uh, but I, I didn't learn these things. So if I didn't learn it, I know a lot of people did not. And uh, from 11th grade, we it was said that uh, YEC, the taking now was going to come. So they separated us, so I became a science student. And so I was not in the history class. So a lot of people did not learn this, I can guarantee you. So it is only here. So please come. And uh, if you have other ideas as how we can, uh, we can get this, Throughout Liberia, please don't hesitate to reach out to call to Barry or me and let's do this together. Until then, we end with our song that says, We are all Liberians. Have a good night, enjoy your weekend, and God bless you. We all Liberians.